smaller David. Adonai rohi loech sar. Minot eshe yarbit seni al memenuchot yanach aleni. Nafshi yishovei. Yanacheni v'maglet tzedek l'ma'an shemo. Gam ki helech begit sal mavet. Lo irarai ki hatai madi. Shivtecha mishantecha hema yinach amoni. Ta'aruch lefanai shulchan Neged Tzorirai Dishanta vashemen roshi Kusiri vayar Ach tov achesed yirdifuni Koyam echayai Shaviti Bevet Adonai Le Orech Yamin. I've chanted for you the words of our twenty third Psalm. In these most difficult times, on days when we are in great need of comfort. We often turn to the psalmist, seeking peace, seeking solace. And so I ask you now to recite these words with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we will remember him. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we will remember him. In the opening buds and in the rebirth of spring, we will remember him. In the blueness of sky and in the warmth of summer, we will remember him. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we will remember him. In the beginning of the year, and when it ends, we will remember him. When we are weary and in need of strength, we will remember him. And when we are lost and sick at heart, we will remember him. When we have joys we yearn to share, we will remember him. So long as we live, he too will live. For he is now a part of us, as we remember Robert Jackson. To you, Lisa, to his children, Laura, Billy, Sammy, Miles, Ethan, Aiden, Camille, to his father-in-law and mother-in-law, Paul and Harriet, his sisters-in-law, his brothers-in-law, Lynn and Nick, Sherry, Mark and Emily. To all the members of the family and to so many dear and cherished friends who have gathered together today, we are here not only to remember, but also to celebrate the life of your beloved Bob. Laura, Sammy, Miles, Ethan, Aiden, and Camille. Your father, your dad, your stepdad, 
I'm certain that he did not personally know the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. However, if you listen to Emerson's words, the words that he uses to describe what it is to have lived a successful life, maybe you'll wonder if the poet knew your father. Emerson writes, to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics, to endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, better, whether by a healthy child, a garden path, or a redeemed social condition, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you lived. This is to have succeeded. Emerson's words only begin to paint the portrait of Bob Jackson. And to his children, I want to say that your dad, whether you called him your dad or Bob, he was a variety of things. He was a friend, an artist, a writer, an athlete, an optimist, a student of life, a teacher, a spiritual soul. He was so many things to so many people, but underlying all of these things, he was a survivor. Bob was born in 1934 in Cleveland to Robert and Mary Jackson. He and his older brother, Tom, of blessed memory, they struggled through a very challenging and very difficult childhood. The boys were orphaned by the time Tom was two and Bob was just six months old. They lived in an orphanage, a foster home, and they lived with numerous relatives until finally they ended up in the home of an aunt and an uncle. And the aunt was an abusive and cruel woman. And when the boys were almost seven and nine years of age, they ran off to escape the abuse and they found a safe haven at the Beach Brook Orphanage. To add to all he already had been through, when Bob was only 11, he lost an eye to acute glaucoma. Both Bob and Tom began attending classes through the Orange School System, and then Bob was one of a handful of kids selected to study at Chagrin Falls. It was here that Bob really began to excel and soar. He was a brilliant student a gifted artist, and was outstanding in athletics, especially in wrestling and football and diving. And it was here that Bob also began to cultivate friendships that would span his entire life, and friendships that grew boyhood buddies into brothers. By the time Bob's high school graduation had arrived, he had been offered over 20 academic, athletic, and art scholarships to several universities. He began his college career at the University of Cincinnati where he wrestled. And after one year there, Bob transferred to the Cooper's School of Art in Cleveland. Bob obtained a BFA in Fine Arts from Kent State, and he began his MFA at Kent State University in printmaking and design. But he did not complete this course as he was offered a job. But as a graduate student, Bob thoroughly enjoyed being a grad assistant. He was quite proud of that and the positive influence that he had on the students he taught. Bob married, and while that marriage ended in divorce, it brought forth three beautiful children. His son, Jonathan, who died as an infant, his daughter, Laura, who is with us today, and his son, Billy. Laura, when I spoke with you on the phone, you said that he was just the best you could ever have. You said your dad was the greatest and that no greater relationship between a father and a child existed. Laura, your father worked diligently to be the best dad. He worked hard to provide for his family, for his children. We know that he worked enthusiastically for R.E. May. This was his career, this was his life's work. This is what Bob did to make a living, but today we all know it's much more important to review 
not what Bob did to make a living, but what he did to make a life. Now one day, Lisa Dennis was meeting her buddy, Jim Vitek, a colleague and a friend for a cup of coffee. And one of Jim's friends, this happened to have been Bob, was invited to join them for coffee. And that coffee led to a date and then to a loving friendship. And Lisa, following a three-year courtship, the two of you were married on January 31st in 2003. Lisa, your beloved was a man who, as you shared with me, who would always see the glass half full. Bob had this way of seeing the world through his very unique rose-colored glasses. Even when he would share with you stories of his childhood, which we know equaled years of abuse and cruelty, he would rather talk about the sweet mem memories of the farm and the animals on the farm instead of talk about the abusive aunt who lived at the farm. Lisa, you recalled that Bob had the ability to find beauty in everything. I found it interesting that you shared that he could see a rock, just a simple gray rock, and he would stop and he'd point it out to you and he'd explain to you how magnificent or how special it was. And then when the two of you, along with your children, Sammy and Miles, when all of you and Bob joined the beautiful Bella Terra family homestead, Bob had a great love and appreciation for it. Here was this man, your husband, a man who came from no family, into this huge, loving family, and he embraced it, and he embraced everyone with an open heart. And with Sammy and Miles, Bob did his very best to be a good listener, a good advisor, and a good friend. Miles, you told me that you and Bob had an interest, a shared love for photography and film. And you said to me that he was everything and more you could want in a stepdad. And Sammy, with just a few words, you gave him the greatest compliment. You said he took us in as his own. And when Ethan and Aiden and Camille entered into Bob and Lisa's world, the Jackson family portrait felt all the more complete. Now, while your dad may not have been the most religious man, he was a very spiritual man, and he was a man who believed in miracles, and he believed that the three of you were his miracle. Your dad was the ultimate teacher. He was a walking dictionary with a fantastic vocabulary. Ethan, your family told me that you are your dad's clone. Whether it's art, intellect, or your shared sense of humor, you and your dad were always on the same wavelength. Ethan, you also took note that your dad would drive you and your brother to school, but he would never take the shortest route. He always took the most scenic, the most beautiful. Aiden, he tried to teach you how to draw, but your lean was more towards athletics. And he was at all of your sporting events, all the baseball games, and he would practice baseball skills with you. And you noted that he was a tremendous Cleveland sports fan. And this was a great love that the two of you shared. Camille, you said that your dad was funny. He told a lot of jokes. And Camille, if anybody laughed at his jokes, then he would tell them over and over and over again. Camille, you said that dad taught you to be loving and he taught you never to be mean. And you said he was the best dad ever. One year ago, Bob's brother, Tom, passed. This was the one person who knew him and loved him from the very, very beginning. When Tom died, Bob created a beautiful tribute to his brother. It's a photograph. It's a photograph of the two brothers as young boys. And the following story lies beneath this picture, which hangs in the family's home. Now, the words that I share with you now are words that Bob wrote to honor his brother. 
And if you should visit the family in the next couple days, you'll see this picture and you'll read these words. This is what Bob wrote on his brother's passing. As young boys, my brother Thomas, Thomas and I, nine and seven years old respectively, lived for a couple of years with our uncle, Lloyd Jones, and his wife, Louise, along with their six children. He was our mother's oldest brother and a poor, struggling farmer. We lived on County Line Road. To get to the school bus each morning, we would have to cross the Chagrin River on a swinging rope bridge. It was old and rickety, made of steel cable with wooden slats, various gaps between them for a floor. I can still vividly remember my fear of having to cross that bridge over the icy river. My brother, always sure-footed, would hold my hand and reassure me that everything would be all right. He would say something like, Bobby, don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. Just hold my hand and watch your step. Follow me. And sure enough, everything would be okay and we always made it to the other side safely. He called me Bobby, up until several weeks ago when he could speak no more. This morning, my brother made it to the other side for the final time. I held his hand as long as I could. Don't be afraid, Tommy. It's going to be okay. Thank you, Tommy, for being my strong and courageous brother I'm so very proud of you. Dearest brother, I love you, Tommy, before having to let go for the last time. Our tradition teaches us that words which come from our heart enter directly to the heart. And so today it is so appropriate that we have several friends and family who have words in their heart that they wish to share with us today. I'd first like to call on his friend, Jim Vitek. Please join me in prayer. Our most gracious Father in heaven, we love you, thank you, and praise you for the blessings that we have received, those that we are currently receiving and those blessings which are on the way. While our hearts seemingly ache without end, they remain full of love for our precious Bob Jackson, husband, father, and friend. We look to you, Lord, for strength and comfort and healing, especially for Lisa, Ethan, Aiden, Camille, Billy, Laura, Samantha, and Miles. Amen. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Vitek. I am but one of many people whom Bob called friend. Aside from his immediate family, I probably knew him better than anyone else. We lived together on several occasions and remained friends for 54 years, best friends. Bob and I met when we were 13 years old. He recently moved to Chagrin Falls and lived in a foster home at the corner of East Washington and Philomathian Streets. When we were 14, something occurred, which we both agreed changed the direction of his life. Now please understand that what I'm about to tell you is not the kind of stuff that you would include in a parent's manual on raising kids, but this is what happened. Bob and I were swimming at the rec center and went into the locker room where a much larger boy, whom we both knew well, started snapping Bob with a wet towel until Bob's body was covered with welts. I was surprised that Bob didn't fight back because I knew something that not many people knew at the time, that Bob's kind and gentle manner belied a really strong 
and tough kid who knew how to fight. After the boy left the locker room, I sat down next to Bob on a bench and said, you don't have to take that from him. Bob, in his usual kindness, replied, no, it's OK. I looked at him and said, no, it's not OK. Then just at that moment, like a figure in a horror film, the boy reappeared and started hurting Bob again. I suggested that we take this outside to the back of the building near the woods where no one could see us. We moved to that location and sure enough the boy started pushing Bob around again. This time Bob fought back. He beat the boy bloody until he was screaming for mercy. Now the next part of the story is the most important part because it illustrates some of the reasons we are here today. Bob not only granted the boy mercy, he showed him grace. Bob took the boy to the foster home, helped him wash up, nursed his wounds, made him a sandwich, <laughs> which he ate at the table, then sent the boy home with the implicit understanding that we are still friends. But don't you ever mess with me again. The boy never did. In fact, I knew of no one who messed with my friend Bob Jackson. Bob went on to become a champion wrestler, earning an athletic scholarship to the university of Cincinnati. He didn't stay long at Cincinnati, but he wrestled four matches before he left. He won three and tied one. Even at the college level, no one beat him. But as much as Bob enjoyed athletics, the real love of his life was art. He developed his skills at Chagrin Falls High School and refined them at Kent State University and the Cooper School of Art. He was a gifted artist. Bob and I lived together for much of our early adulthood. I can't recall both of us ever owning a car at the same time. We were usually a one car family, one person depending on the other to get him to where he needed to be. There were times when we slept on wooden floors without blankets and ate canned spaghetti three times a day. But we considered ourselves blessed to have a place to stay and something to eat. <coughs> and we always had each other. Now here I stand more than a half a century since we first met. And to be honest with you, I don't know what I'm going to do without him. For me, Bob was the rarest of gifts. His heart saw what mine saw. Our friendship was a shared journey, a mutual quest for the secret of our souls. We laughed and grieved and yearned together until we could no more. I think that something in us longs, hopes, and maybe even at some times believes that this is not the way things are supposed to be. We look death in the face and say, I'm not afraid of you, and I will fight you with everything I've got. Death, I will defy you. And so, People with terminal illnesses get married. Prisoners in concentration camps plant flowers. And lovers long apart still reach out in the night to embrace one who is no longer there. It's like the phantom pain that is experienced by people who have lost a limb. Feelings still emanate from that region where there once was a crucial part of them. 
Many of us feel that way today. We've lost someone who was a crucial part of our lives. We can't see him, but we know where he was and where he should still be. Now I will elaborate on something that Kathy mentioned earlier. I was indeed the one who introduced Bob to Lisa. In a former life, I was a psychologist, and Lisa was one of my interns. After I retired, Lisa and I decided to meet at a set time for coffee at Starbucks. I invited Bob to join us at one of our get-togethers, and he did. After the three of us met twice, Bob and Lisa stopped showing up <laughs> at our set appointment. After being stood up three times in a row by my friends, I said to myself, I think these two might be doing stuff behind my back. <laughs> Obviously, it took me a while to catch on, but it wasn't too long before Bob and Lisa were married and having beautiful babies. Don't you wish, my friends, that you had the power to make time stand still during certain moments of your life? Probably all of us have had moments in our past when uh, things which were important seemed to be coming together in a way we knew in our hearts it was always meant to be. That's the way Bob felt when he met Lisa. That's the way he felt about each and every one of his children. While Bob was a cherished friend to us, his main purpose in life was to be a loving husband and father. He valued that more than anything else. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. I want to call on his friend, John Wintrick. I met Bob in 1977 through Tony Rotano in Chagrin Falls. I had just moved to Chagrin and Bob was a new friend and made me feel so welcome and at home in his company. I would call Bob and say, why don't you come over and let's go down to the church parking lot and throw the Frisbee around. <laughs> Remember the Frisbee? So we would do that and have the, just the greatest time Often Bob would come over and we would drink a really nice bottle of Cabernet and play backgammon for hours. While trying to outwit each other, we would talk endlessly about everything and anything that we were passionate about. And all those of us that knew Bob know how passionate he was about everything that mattered to him. Even though we had only first met when we were about 27, we soon discovered we had so much in common and each of us had so many similar and common experiences traveling around as young men in pursuit of our dreams. It was as though we were cut from the same cloth, as they say. 
It didn't take long for me to realize that we had so quickly formed a friendship that would last a lifetime. And I would also discover that it was the friendship of a lifetime. I met so many great people through Bob, and I learned so much through his insight and unparalleled intelligence. His striking good looks and his dynamic personality were infectious. And of course, that smile of his with that endearing space in his front teeth and his warm laughter were traits that made me love him even more. Bob listened to you when you spoke to him. And he genuinely cared about what you had to say. Bob was strong, both physically and mentally, and yet the gentlest of souls. He was never judgmental and always glad to see you. As time went on and life with its many twists and turns took us apart, I returned from California after six years and we reunited. It was as though no time had passed at all and we just picked up where we left off. We had both been through some difficult times, especially Bob. And each of us supported each other in every way possible. It was obvious to me that Bob was a man of high moral character with a heart of gold. Bob and I would go out together and every time we would have the greatest time, we would hug each other and tell each other how much we appreciated our friendship. Our common passions and interests in life were off the charts. Interior decorating, art, photography, music, dance, literature, poetry, sports, nature. And so many of the best things that life has to offer were like religion to us. And we worshiped them all together like brothers from a different mother. In recent years, Bob, Ken Oakson, Angelo Lamarco, and I would meet in the village on Sunday mornings and get on our bikes and go down to River Road and ride and ride and ride. We eventually worked up to 33 mile rides from Chagrin Falls all the way to Squires Castle. For a bunch of old guys, we thought that was pretty darn good. The camaraderie and companionship was healing for each of us because each of us had something good to offer the other. Good, lifelong friends are able to bring out the best and the worst characteristics in each other and help each other face the pain and sorrow that life brings with it, as well as helping each other to embrace the love and joy in life. As I write these words right now, I know Bob is guiding me with his indomitable spirit that will never die. I'm sure that all of us have thought about who they would like to speak at our own funeral. Whenever I have, I always pictured Bob giving my eulogy because he knew me so well. He knew what made me tick. He knew my soul's deepest secrets. And I knew he would speak so eloquently about me and my life. And yet here I am speaking to all of you today about this incredible man and his incredible life. Instead of asking, what could Bob do? One should ask, what couldn't Bob do? He was an infinitely talented, skilled, and industrious. He was an award-winning photographer, award-winning graphic designer, accomplished painter, sculptor, writer, jewelry maker, and so much more. He was fiercely loyal to his friends, family, and those that employed his talents. He was dedicated to his wife and children like no one I have ever known. He bragged about his beautiful Lisa and his children with such pride, and for good reason. 
they are all amazing and he felt so very blessed to have them and the life that he cherished with every waking day. I could talk about Bob for hours and hours and I'm sure that's the case for all of us that were privileged to have known him. I could never say enough about him. I don't have the luxury of that time now but I would like to tell you one story that perhaps some of you have already heard. Bob and I went to one of our favorite places to go and take photos, the Holden Arboretum. We were at one of the ponds there and we came across a huge prehistoric looking snapping turtle on the bank of the pond. It was completely motionless and its eyes were like so mysterious and unwavering. We asked ourselves, is this thing dead or what? After inspecting it for a while and getting no response of any kind, we turned into young boys all of a sudden and did something really stupid. We picked up a stick and decided to prod it closely and see if it was actually alive. With a poke of the stick, it suddenly jumped and snapped at us with that jaw that could cut off your finger in an instant. Like eight-year-old boys, we both flipped over backwards on the ground in a feeble and awkward attempt to avoid disaster. <laughs> we looked at the now broken stick and each other and then broke into hysterical laughter. Our hearts were pounding and we had been outsmarted by a freaking mud-dwelling turtle. <laughs> Feeling defeated, we walked away with our tails between our legs and went about our business of taking nature photographs. And lastly, I would like to say how on any given day, weekday, my phone would ring at about 8.30 in the morning and I would see that it was Bob calling on his way to work. I would answer and say, Roberto, how are you? And he would say, hey, JW, what's going on? Oftentimes, because I am in the business of decorating church interiors, he would call and say with a bad Italian accent, this is Father Guido Sarducci, Mr. Wintrick and I want to decorate the new cathedral that I'm building. Father Sarducci was a character of the 1970s Saturday Night Live fame. And I would say, well, okay, Father, but it will cost you dearly. Send me a check for 100,000 as a deposit and we will get started right away. Then we would go on talking and getting caught up and make each other feel really good for just having talked to each other and getting our days started with a feeling of well-being and laughter and happiness. My life will never be as full and as rewarding as it was with Bob. And like all of us, I will miss him more than words could ever describe. We will all have this huge hole in our lives that can never be filled or occupied by anyone else. This is not goodbye, my friend. Just another chapter in the never-ending saga of life. A life that you made rich and full and exceptionally worth living. Thank you, John. I want to call on his friend, Phil Jones. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, my, my name is Phil Jones. Can this go up? Thanks. And uh, I was privileged and honored to be a lifelong friend of Bob Jackson's. As I'm listening to Jim and John, it occurred to me that uh, I never got together with these guys. Bob had a lot of good friends, but I think he thought it was probably too dangerous to get us all together at the same time. <laughs> uh, I, if I think about my friendship with Bob, I have to go all the way back to 1960 when I was a little kindergartner tooling around with my brother at the Orange High School. 
uh, we were just walking around by these buses and all of a sudden my brother grabs me and goes come on hide come on and and dragged me back in between these two buses and said get down get down here he comes and and I'm like who is this and we went undetected as Bob went by and my brother said that was Bob Jackson he's the baddest toughest meanest guy around and and even he's so bad the cops are afraid of him <laughs> I thought oh my god I want to be his friend <laughs> and my wish came true so from the very beginning as a kindergartner I had Bob in my mind as the toughest guy around now I've got a flash forward to the late 70s Bob actually became very close friends with my two older brothers, Mark and Paul. And during, when Bob was at Kent, they all lived together in a house. And at that time, I was in high school living on my sister's farm in Bainbridge. And they would come visit, or I would go down there and visit. But one way or the other, I started to get to know Bob. It was right after my 11th grade, I was between 11th and 12th grade in high school, that. I decided it would be a good idea to go visit the three of them and at this time the three of them had moved all the way to San Francisco and rented a house together. So they finished up at Kent, they were in San Francisco and I thought I'd go see them. I'm telling this because this is one of my favorite Bob Jackson stories because when I started to think about what I wanted to talk about I really had a hard time talking, deciding what to tell. Um, but this one is probably one my favorite here I am kind of coming off the farm from Bainbridge into the big city of San Francisco with probably a million people and all the sites and things to do these guys all had something to do the, my very first day there and they set me on my own with a map and said you're gonna be a tourist so I thought okay I'll do that so I went around San Francisco to Fisherman's Wharf and the cable cars and you know, just did all the typical tourist things. And in the middle of the afternoon, I happened to be on Market Street, which is the biggest, or I, I mean the busiest street in San Francisco. And I happened to be standing right on a cement island where you catch the cable car. I gotta be very careful about this story I'm about to tell. Um, I'm standing there and the cable car is coming up and all of a sudden it's coming to a stop and I look up in the window and there's Bob with his face almost pressed against it staring right at me giving me a hand gesture that I can't talk about <laughs> and I was shocked I just went oh my god you know Bob <sighs> and that that started our our relationship because at that moment I realized I don't think he was telling me I was number one but he was the coolest guy at that moment. And, and throughout that summer, he did a few other things. He spent time with me. Um, I, he introduced me to Van Morrison's album, St. Dominic's Preview, which became one of my favorite all-time albums, along with the album with uh, Stairway to Heaven on it and Led Zeppelin. And we would sit and listen to these songs and analyze it and talk about it. And uh, I, I realized at the end of that summer, he was the coolest guy around. Then I'm kind of flash forwarding into the 80s when we were all back here. Bob and Mary were living on American Street in Sugar Falls. And I was living uh, in a log house out in Parkman. And I went through a very nasty divorce at that time. And what I can recollect from that period was that Bob and Mary were an incredible support group to me because I. And it was a real difficult divorce for me. And I, I would go over to their house on a Friday night, and we'd have a few beers and just talk and talk and talk. Or we'd go to dinner. Uh, we just spent time. Bob listened. He was a phenomenal listener, and he cared, as you already heard. Um, so when I think back on that period, I didn't realize it, but he was being the nicest guy around to me.
Our friendship spanned decades. And if, even if there was periods of radio silence or we were living thousands of miles away, we stay connected. I lived in uh, England in 1994. I was managing a plant there. So I was all the way over there, and Bob would take the initiative to call me and check in on me every so often. I'd be at, on my job in my office, and I'd get a call, and uh, he'd say, hey, Phil, uh, it's Bob. I'm at Heathrow Airport, and I need a job. <laughs> or he'd say, I'm coming into your lobby to fill out an application. I'll do anything. And, and you know, that's, that was just a little bit about our relationship of how much uh, interactions and fun we had together. I have to say that we had so many gut-wrenching laughs. I can't think of anybody else that I had so many gut-wrenching laughs together. And What a gift. What a real gift and a privilege it was to have that in my life. So he was the funniest guy around for me at times. Um, I remember when Bob started talking about Lisa. Uh, he was so excited, and we were thrilled when they got married. He was just he, he was just so thrilled and excited about spending his life with Lisa that uh, you know it was a joy to to witness that. And he loved his children, all seven of them: Laura, Billy, Sammy, Miles, Ethan, Aiden, and Camille. He loved you guys immensely. So, um, to me, Bob was, as I said, the toughest guy around the coolest guy around. He was the nicest guy around. He was the funniest guy around. He was great. He was the greatest friend to have. Coming up to recent days, it was during one of my, sorry, it was during one of my last visits with Bob when he told me how much he wanted to get better so he could be a part of his children's life as they were growing up. He referred to Lisa. This was just recently in the hospital down at the Cleveland Clinic. He referred to Lisa as his miracle. And he said it was so comforting to him to have her sleeping. He could hear her breathing in the room and that was so comforting to him at night. Just a few days before he passed, my oldest brother Mark was there, and they were very, as I mentioned, really good friends and close. And the last thing I heard Bob say to my brother Mark through his oxygen mask, he said, I have gratitude. And that, to me, was so profound. That explained, that just kind of wrapped it up what Bob Jackson was like. <laughs> I was blessed, as I said, and privileged to have him as a friend. I will forever remember him with love. I would like to uh, just finish with a, a quick, brief poem. The name of this poem is Miss Me But Let Me Go. When I come to the end of the road and the sun has set for me, I want no rights in a gloom-filled room. Why cry for a soul set free? Miss me a little bit, but not for too long, and not with your head bowed low. Remember the love that we once shared. Miss me, but let me go. For this is a journey that we must all take. And now each of us must go it alone. It's all a part of the master's plan in a step on the road home. When you are lonely and sick of heart, go to the friends we know. And bury your sorrow in doing good deeds. Miss me, but let me go. Thank you, Phil. 
I want to call on Bob and Lisa's friends, Gemma Smith and Lar Hayes. how myself and Bob develop a friendship and um, we actually didn't really have a choice our two wives Gemma and Lisa fell in love first right so you know we, uh, they developed a, a very special and uh, unbreakable bond and uh, you know us two dopes we basically had to get on the bus you know and go with the go with the ride or get off and be miserable so well, it turns out, you know, that we actually were two birds of a feather. You know, it just I was laughing to myself just last week at the hospital. Like most of us, we were sitting there, sitting there in one, one evening, just the two of us. And uh, he dozed off. And like everybody else that was up in that hospital room, uh, all I kept doing was looking at those bloody numbers at that screen, right? We all looked at those numbers. And uh, he just... he turned around, popped up, and looked at me and said, Irish man, he said, he said, we're made from the same cloth. He says, me and you, me and you, Lar, and then just went right back to sleep. So, you know, this past year, especially, especially, I've known Bob for a few years now, but this past year, we've had some really, really co good conversations. Some of, them, some of them were pretty deep, and some of them not so deep, depending on you know how many bottles of wine <laughs> we happen to open that night. <laughs> but um, the you know the conversation that stays with me the most, the conversations we had, was we always talk about how we both have this free spirit, and that we were kind of like these two wild horses, and you know we ran really hard and fast through life, and we'd only just recently crossed paths but we know we had been on that same path for a long time. And what really, you know, terrified us actually both uh, is that we didn't know where the end of that crazy path was, right? And then for me, and obviously for Bob, you know, Gemma and, and, and Lisa, you know, these two beautiful, strong, selfless, loving women came into our lives. And, uh, you know, we both found this internal happiness, this peace, and, uh, you know, we, did, we had no need to run anymore. We didn't, you know, we were home. So it's, uh, I just, I always remember too, and I've heard John and I've heard Jim say that, you know, time and time again, Bob would tell us, you know, how privileged and how honored and how lucky he was to have such a beautiful wife and Lisa and the kids and his family and how blessed he was. I mean, he would say that over and over and he was just in awe of, of the, the love you guys had for him. You know, Gemma once told me that you're never truly gone as long as somebody remembers you. You're still always here as long as somebody's remembered you. So I've been trying really hard <laughs> to, get, to get my head around, you know, especially why he had to, why he had to suffer for this past month, and, and, and why, you know, after everything he's been through, and, you know, why we had to suffer, why his family, and, you know, and, and I truly believe that we were all given this time so that we could actually, we could actually tell him that we were the ones that were actually honored and privileged to actually have known Bob. And I think every single one of us that knows Bob, that truly knew Bob, is a much better person today because of it. And Bob, it was important for Bob to know that. I know it was. Oh, God. He was my brother. You know, I want him to run today. I want the horse to run. I want him to run with Tom, his brother. I want him to run with Mark. 
but like Mark, I don't want him to go far, right? Because I promise you, and like everybody here, we'll never forget you, Bob. So, uh, I, in thinking about Bob, right, it took me like six hours sitting at my computer trying to come up with something succinct to say about him. Uh, you can't, you, can, you just can't put him into words, especially in five minutes. So, uh, I wanted to like sort of give my view of who w Bob was for I think a lot of you that are here from the baseball families and the soccer families. And I met, I first met Bob as like this happy-go-lucky guy that sat in his lawn chair and just like <laughs> enjoyed the game, said hi to everybody, welcomed everybody, you know, this kind, just kind guy. And it, he, was the, he was the one that you'd actually seek for and be like, oh, there's Bob, I'm gonna put my lawn chair right next to him. Because you knew that you'd have a beautiful conversation, you'd have a beautiful afternoon, you'd get a play-by-play -play description of the game, and the most important part is that you saw this guy looking at his kids, you guys, Aiden and Ethan, and you just saw this awe in him, just looking at you play. He was so proud. And then, as our friendship deepened and we started spending more time together, I got to experience the Bob that miserably tried but failed to sneak one past Lisa. <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, Lisa and I were sort of like the cops for <laughs> Bob and Lara. And, <laughs> and, you know, he would put this phase, like it was this mix between annoyance and this smirk, like I tried. And Lisa, I think that's the part that he enjoyed the most, you know, being caught, because that made him feel that he was loved. That thing that he didn't have when he was growing up, you gave him that. So Bob and I bonded over politics and, you know, <laughs> the deep pain we feel about Trump winning and <laughs> <laughs> and the loss of heart and justice and the crazy rise of this greed and ugliness in the world and we'd like spend hours talking about this and send each other anti-Trump stuff. <laughs> Sorry for the Trump supporters. <laughs> but he ha that had to be brought up. <laughs> And he, like, you know, like maybe three or four days ago, he told me to watch the Eisenhower's exit speech. And of, of course, I had no clue what that was. I didn't even know it existed because I'm really not as cultured as he is. But you know what? I think we should all watch it. And I'm, I'm darn sure that we'll learn something about from that. So as I said, it's impossible to encapsulate Bob in five minutes. I don't know how, how long I've already been speaking for, but I want to I wanna leave you with the last part of Bob that I got to enjoy. And that was the sheer courage and strength and utter love and devotion he had for his family and his family had for him. Bob's spirit like seemed to grow larger and larger in that hospital room as he got sicker and he fought his last wrestling match like the roughest seas in a storm. Like it was, it was incredible to watch and heartbreaking at the same time. But through all of this, he remained the happy-go-lucky Bob that I met at the baseball field. He said hello to all the nurses. He knew them all by name. He had a kind smile, a thank you after everything, and freaking jokes in between his breaths that I'm probably, should I repeat it? No. Okay, Lisa. 
<laughs> so, kids, know that your father lit up every time he was texted with you. The way that he described each one of you showed me how to be a better parent. Lisa, textually, you were his angel, his miracle, and his savior. You were the rock all the way until his last breath, Lisa. And I'm just so deeply humbled and honored to be your friend and to have been by Bob's side. This is a friendship and a gift that I can never repay. Laura, Sammy Miles, Ethan, Aiden, and Camille, your father was larger than life. You have not had him as, as long as you deserve to have him. But don't ever, ever forget that you have his spirit, his beautiful spirit in him. He has given you, each of, each of you, traits that you already all express, and a vast amount of memories and experiences that you will live and honor him by. And like your father hurt so much way too often, you're hurting now. But remember that this is, this hurt is what made your father, this beautiful, devoted husband and father, and this amazing and beloved friend to many, and the incredibly rich and complex and beautiful human being he died as. So carry him in his heart, in your heart, forever and make him proud. Bob, one more time, thank you, and I love you. Thank you, Gemma and Lar. Friends, we have one more speaker. His daughter, Laura, has written some beautiful words to share with us. of people before me have talked about how hard my father fought. And I can tell you, as a Jackson, no matter what fight we face, we always go down swinging. That he did. My dad loved on a different level than most people. That awareness will transform the lives of my siblings forever. That memory, that love, and that bond that he had with you as his child will always be with us wherever we go. Of course, as my father's oldest daughter and a Jackson, I didn't have a lot of words <laughs> at the time of his illness. But I've been blessed for 34 years to have him as a father. In the last days that he was with us, I wrote him a poem that I haven't shared with anyone until now. There's a reason I'm not wearing all black. And the title of this poem is called Color. It's my father's art and life brought so much color. Not many can feel the colors you see. 
as your vision excludes no colors to be. In both the light and darkness of the world around, your colors are in endless skies to the earth we are bound. I watched you paint from a time in which I was small, using purples and blues for trees that stood tall. You always saw color that knew no end, and the lesson this taught me was not to depend on the constraints of specifics that others would lend. You painted the sky above my very first bed. You showed me opportunity in the colors of yellow, blue, and red. While all canvases began with possibility, you taught potential was nothing without effort from me. You said fear is not something to run from, saying run to your fears and great things will come. For the challenge to see the colors in all that we do was the greatest of lessons and it came from you. And while I may get stuck in some shades of gray, I have promised myself not to look away as the dawn always brings new colors each day. No color is greater than others around, only complementing each other once they are found. I will thank you forever for all the beauty you share as your vision sees no limit to challenges dared. Your lessons in color map my adventures to come and forever will be the beginning of where I am from. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. At this time, I'd like to ask all who are able to rise to please do so. I share with you the words of a prayer known as El Mole Rahamim, the memorial prayer. El Mole Rahamim, Shochen Bamromim, Am Semen Ochanechonat, Achat Kanfechashina. Malohut kidoshim utorim, kizor hararakia masirim. Et nihish mat yakirainu, shahalach leolama begana den tehemenu hata. Ahna baharahami mastirehu, besetter knafahle ramim, betitur arbitur arahaim et nishmato. Adonai huna halato, bianuach bishalom. Al Mishkavo, bin Omar, Amen. O merciful God who dwells on high, who is full of compassion, grant perfect rest beneath the shelter of your divine presence among the holy and pure, who shine as the brightness of the firmament, to our dear departed Robert Jackson, who goes now to his eternal home. May Bob's soul be bound up in the bonds of eternal life, and grant that his memory inspire all of us to noble and consecrated living. And to this we answer, Amen. Before we conclude with the Mourner's Kaddish, just a couple brief announcements. The family will receive friends at the residence of Harriet and Paul Dennis, located at 16860, that's 16860 Catston Road in Chagrin Falls. Visitation will be today until 5 p.m. and also tomorrow from 5 until 8 p.m. Anyone who is wishing to perhaps make a contribution, the family has suggested that those be directed in memory of Robert Jackson and directed to the Cleveland Museum of Art. We join now together in the words of the Kaddish. As we say, Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei Raba, Bealma divrach irute, v'yamlich malchute, v'chayichon uv'yomechon, uv'chaye d'chol beit Yisrael, Bagala uv'izman kariv v'yamru, amen. Yehei shemei Raba mevarach le'olam olome omaya, 
יתברך וישתבח ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנשא ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל שמי תקודשה בריכו. לאלה מן כל ברכתה ושירתה תושבחתה ונחמתה דאמירן בעלמה יאמרו אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיא וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל ויאמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל ויאמרו אמן. We pray that God who makes peace in a high place send peace and comfort to you the mourners, to Israel, and to all humankind. And to this we can answer. Amen. On behalf of the entire family, we thank you for your love and support on this important day.